the the wonderful moment has arrived with our illustrious um, uh, speaker today, California Attorney General Rob Bonta. Attorney General Bonta was born in the Philippines and received his BA and his law degree from Yale University. His parents were social activists who worked alongside Cesar Chavez for the United Farm Workers. In okay, go for it. In 2012, he was the first Filipino American to win election to the California State Legislature. And in April of 2021, he became California's first Attorney General uh, of Filipino descent. Since then, he has worked tirelessly as the attorney for the people of California, passing major reforms to reverse longstanding injustices. And today he's going to provide us with an update on some of the most important legal issues facing our state. Uh, today's presentation, my understanding, is dedicated to his father, Warren Bonta, who was a longtime member of Renaissance, very revered by our organization, and he was also a devoted uh, civil rights activist. Um, when Warren passed... When, when Warren passed away unexpectedly last year, uh, we named our annual Diversity and Inclusion Award for, um, for Warren Bonta. I would also like to add that in addition to all his social justice activities, uh, Attorney General Bonta remains a formidable force on the soccer field. At last year's legislative soccer game, which pitted Northern California legislators against Southern California legislators, of whom there are more, right? Attorney General Bonta uh, represented Northern California. His, his, his uh, opponents, the Southern California guys, said they had one cry, one cry, stop Bonta. Right. Well, they failed. He scored four goals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our wonderful state attorney general, Rob Bonta. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deborah, for that very kind introduction. Love the soccer part at the end. I'll try to ask others to use that in their introduction of me in, in uh, other occasions. And uh, thank you to, for all that you do uh, as a Renaissance Society for each other for others who uh, have been part of your uh, chapter in the past who will join you in the future. Can you hear me okay? Okay, okay. And um, a special thanks for the home and the, the place and space that you provided for my father. And I, he talked about the Renaissance Society to me often. I uh, had a chance to speak to this group um, a few years ago now, and I'm honored and grateful for the chance to talk to you again. And I know this is a place that gave him meaning and fulfillment and opportunity to do what he loved to do, take on uh, and think about and take action regarding the, the issues of the day that face us and uh, give us an opportunity to uh, right wrongs, face injustices and make our community better. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you also for naming the Diversity and Inclusion Award in his, in his name. Uh, I, I'm touched by that. I know he would be too. So thank you. Um, I'll chat a little bit about my pathway to AG and then some of the stuff we're working on. And then I mostly just want to have a, a you know informal, casual conversation about whatever's on your mind. I know thinking about our uh, not so much our state, but our world, our, our, our nation and where it could go, um, possible, you know, dark um, paths. Um, but uh, but where we hope it might not go, um, there's a lot to talk about. So let me just share kind of um uh, how I got to this role and, and how I approach this role of being California Attorney General. Uh, um, my pathway rolls right through Sacramento. I, I was born in the Philippines, and when I was two months old, my parents made for me uh, what was probably the most important decision ever made in my life. It was made when I was just born. It was made about me. I had no agency in it. It wasn't made by me. Uh, and my, this was the decision. Uh, my mom and my dad, who were serving in the Philippines as missionaries, asked themselves after having my older sister first, in, who was born in Manila, then me, born in Quezon City, Philippines, they asked themselves if they could raise their son and their daughter in a place where there was democracy, where there was freedom, where there was human rights, where there was civil rights, where there was the rule of law. And they looked out into the future in the Philippines, and their answer was no. Unfortunately, not then. 
a dictator was rising to power. Martial law was on the verge of being declared. And exactly one year from my birthday, September 22nd, martial law was declared. And a dictator rose to power and took away all the things they wanted from me. There was no democracy. There was no freedom. There were no human rights. The political opponents to Ferdinand Marcos were arrested and captured and imprisoned, tortured and killed. My mom was an outspoken uh, dissident to that rule. She wanted democracy for her people in the, in the place that she grew up. So their choice was to bring me here to California. We, our first stop was LA. And that's when my parents started working for the United Farm Workers of America. Uh, they started, they grabbed clipboards, rolled up their sleeves and started collecting signatures outside of supermarkets as part of the lettuce boycott. And then we were, uh, they were invited to go to La Paz, the headquarters of the UFW movement in um, the Central Valley. So LA, then Central Valley, specifically La Paz outside of Bakersfield. We lived in a trailer. My parents got $5 a week for their service to the union. My dad worked in the front office with Cesar Chavez. Pretty cool when your office made a Cesar Chavez. And uh, the executive assistant to Cesar Chavez, Jose Gomez, was someone who became a, f a close family friend, and he became my godfather. Uh, my dad set up health care clinics for the farm workers who were feeding our state, feeding our nation. My mom worked in the preschool so that those who were working in the fields and organizing in support of them had a place where their children could learn and grow. And Dolores Huerta was there. Philip Veracruz, the great Filipino leader, uh, came to our trailer. My mom would make Filipino breakfast for him. So they were in the middle of one of the greatest social justice movements in the history of our state, in the history of our nation. And I'm very proud of that fact. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, and, and just taking one step back in time, and I'll, I'll come back to La Paz. Um, my parents met in Berkeley, California in, the 19, in 1965. So my mom had taken a, a ship for three weeks from the Philippines to uh, Berkeley. And um, my dad grew up in Ventura County, Moore Park. He, he went to community college uh, in Moore Park and then transferred, uh, as many students did then and do today, to UC Berkeley, to UC, and then graduated from there. And then they both met at graduate school in Berkeley, but the Pacific School of Religion, PSR, seminary. And uh, this school was known for uh, being a social justice advocacy um, seminary that, that turned beliefs about who we are and where we'll go and inclusion and opportunity for all into action. And when he was there, uh, he had a friend across the country in Selma, Alabama, who was organizing and activating and listening to this incredible leader talk about a more equal society, a more fair world. And this student, friend of my father, would record his voice and send it to my father across the country on audio cassette tape. When I'm talking to students, young students, they're like, what's an audio cassette tape? So uh, I know what an audio cassette tape is. Uh, and he would, my dad would tear open this package, these packages when they would come in, eager for each one as it came in through the mail, and listen. And he was listening to the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. from across the country. And he felt called. He felt compelled to go, to act, to be part of something special. He felt it was an inflection moment in our country's history, and it was. And he wanted to help push for more justice and more fairness. And so he went. He jumped on a train uh, three days uh, on Amtrak, arrived in Selma, Alabama. He met Stokely Carmichael. He was in church when Martin Luther King came for a special speech. He organized for voting rights. He organized for civil rights. So that's, and then my parents got married. They got married at a time when their marriage uh, in many states in this union would have been illegal, but not in California. And then, and then the Philippines as missionaries. And then let me jump back to La Paz. Um, activism from the civil rights movement to the farm worker movement was part of my family's legacy. It's who they are. It's what they did. Uh, I was a young child when most of it happened, but I grew up hearing about Cesar and Martin at the breakfast table and at the dinner table. And um, growing up, uh, my mom continued to organize for the restoration of democracy in the Philippines. And my entire childhood, from the time I could remember till I was a teenager, I would go to rallies and protests and demonstrations, protesting against the human rights abuses in the Philippines and the need to restore democracy to the people of the Philippines. And I remember in 1986 when the People Power Revolution occurred and um, Fernand Marcos was toppled and democracy was restored. I remember how much that meant to my mom. 
and that she could now return to the Philippines to see family uh, in safety and without fear. And being seeing my parents be part of those movements, locking arms with everyday people and saying, if we commit to a common cause, there's nothing we can't do. And then not just saying it, but doing it. Civil rights movement, farm workers movement, toppling a dictator an ocean away. It made me believe that we can do anything we want if we put our mind to it. And I also saw them as they organized with everyday people. I saw them ask, sometimes beg people with power, elected officials, people in suits with authority. They would ask them to side with them. Fight with us, stand with us, stand near us. Take on our cause as your cause. And most of the time, those elected officials didn't do it. That they were focused on other things, other agenda items, other priorities. And so one of the things I wanted to do, and I asked myself, maybe one day I could be an elected official and not have to beg somebody to do what I know was right and listen to the people and fight for them and use that positional power for good. And so that was my dream. <laughs> I think the, the jury's out on that. That is my that is my goal and my hope and my and um, what I want to do. And uh, um, that's why I see service. And I, you know, my parents they believed in me. I'm grateful for that. They believed in me when I was two months old and said, "You can have unlimited potential if we bring you to a place where they allow it." And they taught me and and told me as I grew up, "You can go to college if you work hard enough." I know you can. You can go to law school if you dream big enough. And I was able to do both. And one thing that really helped me was, um, I think it was somewhat accidental, but ended up being a, um, a big part of my life. My parents described me as a young boy in the kindest, most loving way as someone who had a lot of energy. And talking to their fellow activist friends who they would ask to babysit me, I've now learned that they would all um, say no and hand it off to the next person because uh, they didn't want little Robbie. Uh, uh, I would jump off the furniture. I, I remember being one distinct memory is being very sweaty as a young boy uh, since I was in constant motion and very active. But so one of my one thing my parents did when I was seven years old, um, we were in we had moved to Sacramento. So I, I ended up saying that my pathway to this role comes through Sacramento. By the time I was in first grade, we were here. My dad had got recruited after organizing um, to set up healthcare clinics with the farm workers to do the same for the state of California, to set up clinics in, in rural areas for refugee communities and disadvantaged communities and those who didn't have access to healthcare. And so we moved to Sacramento. It was new to us. Um, both my parents ended up working for the state. I went to, uh, we grew up in, I grew up in Fair Oaks, California. I went to Pershing Elementary School. I went to Winston Churchill Middle School. I was bused for a special academic program to Winston Churchill, which is outside of our, wasn't the neighborhood school. And then I went to Bella Vista. So I'm a, I'm a Bronco and uh, grew up here, went to great California public schools. But when I was seven, uh, another very important decision was made for my parents, uh, brought me to a soccer field. I had met a friend in, in, in uh, elementary school who was playing soccer. And I said, I I'd like to try it. And I ran around, I had fun. I wanted to come back the next day, but most important to my parents, I went to bed early that night without a fuss. And they're like, we like this. Let's do it again. So they brought me back. And that led to a, a very um, wonderful um, uh, opportunity for me to, to, to see the world, play competitive soccer. My family didn't travel. We only would go where we could drive to. Never got on a plane anywhere as a family for vacation or anything like that. But I was on planes all the time playing soccer in other countries and other continents, seeing the world, learning and growing. And ultimately, it was a pathway to go to college. I was a national recruit. I, I wanted to combine sports with academics and went to the East Coast. Um, I did go to college, as my parents hoped for me. I did go to law school as well. And um, I wanted the law, and I believe the law was, uh, was and could be and should be a force for good. And so that's how I see the attorney general's role, uh, wielding that very important authority, uh, using the law to help people when they're hurt and you know do as much good as you can and hurt, um, uh, help everyday people when they're threatened and being abused by those with power who abuse their power. That is the part where we can really even the scales, whether it be individuals hurting others, corporations abusing their power, we step in. And so as attorney general, I see my role as being the people's attorney, fighting for everyday people, making yours, making California's fights, my fights, standing by them as they fight those fights. So the biggest issues in California are the biggest issues that we're facing and, and confronting and working on, whether it be public safety in all its forms, human trafficking, gun violence, fentanyl, 
um, organized retail crime. We're involved in complex investigations uh, and takedowns of organizations involved in all those areas of crime, uh, whether it be housing, not something that the AG has typically been known for or actually, you know, been that active in. We're pushing uh, to have compliance with the law throughout the state so that more housing is built for more Californians. Right now, the average house uh, is $800,000, or the median rather. And I wonder where my kids will live, whether they can own a home. And that dream of home ownership in California seems to be getting further and further out of reach. So I'm trying to grab it, bring it closer to more Californians so they can have that opportunity. We protect the civil rights of Californians when they're violated. And that looks like a lot of different things, whether it be discrimination based on race or gender or gender identity. Um, uh, the list goes on. We're very active in that space. We're taking on gun violence. We're fighting for reproductive freedom. Uh, we're holding corporations accountable when they violate the law. Um, so the one great thing I love about this job is that on any issue and on every issue that you read about in the news that is important to you, we have something we can do or say about it. And that's what I always wanted uh, to do, to accomplish in office, have a say, have a voice, help shape the future for the better for as many people as I can. And uh, we're in California, the largest state in the nation, the fourth largest economy in the world, a place where they say, as California goes, so goes the country. So we have a lot of opportunity to do good. We're not without our challenges. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but you're not going to fix them unless you confront them and take them on head on. And that's what we're seeking to do. So, And I know that uh, that's what the Renaissance Society is about as well, um, engaging on issues, knowing and believing that we can do better, that where we are today isn't where we have to be tomorrow, that we can take on these challenges, we can provide better, that we need to leave the next generation was something better than what we had. And it's gonna take a lot to do that. We have a climate crisis that's heating up. We have kids who are saying, just give us a place to learn without the threat of school violence. Um, we have um, extremism and uh, freedoms and rights being taken away in different ways. So um, the challenges are enormous, but um, where I started is where I'll end, which is when my parents organized and they changed societies and communities and life circumstances for the people that they fought for. They showed me that we have agency. We can do something about our future. And you know that, and I know that. And so um, politics is a contact sport. And so there's a lot of contact right now. Um, and we have to be ready for that and um, be able to stay involved and engaged and not have to watch our future unfold. But bend and shape our future to where we want it to go. So we have work ahead, um, but I'm excited for the opportunity. I think California is and continues to be the greatest state in the nation and the greatest country in the history of the world. Um, but it, it's also an aspiration. Uh, it's not just a place. It's an idea to always be better, to always confront uh, what's wrong um, and look for places to grow and improve and be better. And so we're engaged in that, um, that work and proud to have the opportunity to do that. I'll leave it at that and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Okay, uh, would somebody else like to pass help pass the mic here? Because we're going to have lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, Tom, thank you. Okay, uh, there's one right here. I saw the first hand go up right here. Hi, I've got a question for you. It's it's about uh, the 14th Amendment and putting Donald Trump on the ballot. What are your thoughts and how valid is it among other, are the attorney generals or just what's what's going on? Uh, f fully expect this room to be interested in the 14th Amendment and and and, and it's and its impact on uh, on the presidential election. I mean, it's in our Constitution. So so what's in the Constitution? Disqualification from being a candidate for president if you're involved in an insurrection. Now, there's not a lot of case law on this. There's not a lot of examples of what this means and how you implement it and what the standard is and what qualifies for uh, um, you know being involved in an insurrection such that you are disqualified from being on the ballot. And um, we're very aware of it. We are engaging on it. We are looking deep into it, uh, trying to study the you know the the origin and the the debate as it became part of our, our constitution and, and what it means and any applications that have occurred historically and, and what it means today. And our goal always is to do it straight up, 
to be fair, to apply the facts to the law. And it's in the constitution, so it means something. And But we wanna get it right and don't wanna use it as a political tool, but as a, um, you know, as the law should be applied under the right circumstances. And, and when you have something like this, you know, we're in a politicized world and we have many AGs and secretaries of state who are looking at it. Um, the likelihood is that there will be some action taken on it somewhere and it'll make its way to the US Supreme Court. It's a federal question. It's a constitutional question. So this Supreme Court will have a role. Um, you can determine what that will mean for it's the you know the outcome of the final decision on this. But um, I know I just met with attorneys general throughout from throughout the country in, in a conference and we're all thinking about it. Is it my turn? Oh, okay. Uh, the fentanyl crisis, uh, the governor has acted on it partially. Uh, well, why are the Democrats in the legislature uh, refusing to give longer prison time and stiffer prison sentences to people who deal in fentanyl? Why? I'm really curious about that. So, so one, one thing about me and my role is, one, I, I'm not in the legislature anymore. Um, I, I'm in the executive branch, very happily so. I, I, I love nine years in the, in the legislature and now happy in the executive branch. And I don't speak for all Democrats. I, I speak for me. And when it comes to fentanyl, um, I think we should be using all tools in the toolbox that make a difference to address what is a crisis. And I th my uh, belief is that the, the, the best thing that you can do is stop fentanyl from ever coming into our state and prevent its movement throughout our state as far upstream as possible. Meaning generally, here's how fentanyl comes into the, to California. Raw materials generally uh, come from China. They are, uh, there are pill presses in Mexico and they come across the border uh, through ports of entry or, or through, or so through ocean or land into California. And then they start moving from South to North through our main arteries, I-5 usually. And we've made a lot of significant busts on the I-5. There've been some really uh, good busts at ports of entry as well before it comes in. That's best because it never gets into an area where it's sold. It never gets into the hand of a child or an individual. It doesn't get laced into Percocet or some other um, medicine that is unsuspecting. Um, so there's a lot of ways to address fentanyl. One is prevention, that's one. And I like to look at the data um, on how to address crime. And the, here's what the data says. The biggest deterrent to committing a crime is the belief that you will get caught if you commit a crime. It's getting caught. So here's what's not a deterrent, uh, as much of a deterrent, deterrent to committing a crime. The belief that you will get 10 years versus five. People don't say, if I get arrested and get caught, I'll do five, that's cool but I will never do 10. They don't think like that. They don't want to do any. They don't want to get caught. So the impact of sentencing on crime um, is, in the, is in the data. The impact of arrests on crime is in the data as well. We need to arrest people and we need to arrest people and give them a proportionate sentence to what they've done. Higher volumes of fentanyl being sold or trafficked, higher sentence, lower amounts, lower sentence, but always accountability. So um, we have had very um, long sentences for a long time. It has led to excessive sentencing in my personal perspective. It has led to mass incarceration in my personal perspective. There's been a movement to move the pendulum closer to the middle. So where the accountability is always proportionate to the crime, more severe accountability for more severe crimes, um, more proportionate accountability for less severe crimes. And so maybe that is part of what some Democrats might be thinking, but I don't know what's in their mind. Um, I think we should be taking down uh, as much fentanyl as close to the border as possible, and that's what we're focused on. They're on. So the question is, we came down here, um, way which have been in, in in place for 50 years, one of the first times. Sorry, you didn't say all this, but I'm, I'm sad. Exactly. So, uh, not the Supreme Court had taken away a right, um, as opposed to granting a, a right. 
So in, in many ways from sort of a historical perspective um, going going backwards. And and the question is, what, what if a federal judge uh, seeks to sort of attack the protections or undermine the protections here in California? California in response among many other things, um, put Proposition 1 on the ballot to enshrine in the state constitution, uh, the right to uh, contraception, uh, privacy, and um, uh, abortion. It was voted in by the voters of California overwhelmingly, so it's in our state constitution. It was already in our state uh, statutes, so the constitution is a stronger level of protection. But if the U.S. Supreme Court said it is unconstitutional to have a a an abortion, that would that trumps the, 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 the there's the federal supremacy clause federal law trumps and is supreme to state law that could happen um right now uh, dobbs was was very awful and the sort of those who want to moderate its awfulness on the right side on on, on the right said this is a state's issue so states you decide and california has decided very clearly other states have decided the same uh, and we're, we're, we're pretty split between red and blue states throughout the nation. Um, there's been an ongoing attack on you know, sort of taking Dobbs and trying to turn it into more restrictions for some. And 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 the effort to reverse Roe versus Wade was decades in the making. And, you know, horrible outcome from my perspective, people getting hurt, access to health care, um, bodily autonomy, reproductive freedom, all undermined. Um, but an incredible, disciplined, resilient campaign to, to, to do it. And something that we have to take note of um, because the impact is, 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 is something that we're all living with. And it involves putting certain Supreme Court justices with certain views about reproductive freedom on the court. Uh, Trump had three and, and made it count for, for him and um, to the detriment of, of many, in my humble opinion. Um, the Mifepristone ban is 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 not hypothetical. That's that's happening, and the attorneys general, um, Mifepristone is essentially an abortion pill. Uh, that's that is, um, and there is a certain legal um, pathway that those trying to continue to roll back reproductive freedom are taking. It starts in Texas, in the federal court, and then it goes to the Fifth Circuit and then it goes to the US Supreme Court. And there are judges in that pathway that are very supportive of rolling back additional reproductive freedom. Um, we're in the Fifth Circuit now on Mifepristone. We have a stay from the US Supreme Court. Um, there's good law in 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 this space and with respect to the, the, the Federal Drug Administration, deference to them, they approved it. Um, it should be available nationwide, but there's all sorts of different arguments that we'll continue to fight, and we're deep in them. There's things like the Comstock Act, which addresses um, the mailing of of uh, abortion medication over state lines, and so we're, we're involved in that. We're um, getting ready for the possibility of a congressional ban if the elections don't go the way uh, they might otherwise go, and and there's a, there's a federal ban, and, and, and folks have promised that that's not what this is. It's supposed to go to the state states' rights, but you know, not everyone signed on to to that promise. And the future is full of possibility for those who see it in in, in whatever way they see it. And so, we're we're briefing arguments against a federal ban. And you know, how is this a federal issue? How can how can they make that decision? Um, where where what are, where are state rights? Um, it's including some very creative approaches like the Thirteenth Amendment and involuntary servitude. And being forced to bring, you know, to carry a pregnancy to term, and there's, you know, there's, there's um, law review articles written on this, and a lot of research to be done. If the U.S. Supreme Court bans it, I mean, they're the highest, they're the highest court in the land, and I have my opinions about this court and its current constitution and how they've acted and based on what they've said, um, what they've done with respect to ethical guidelines or not. Um, and my team is very nervous when I talk about it because we're in front of that court all the time. And, but I, I feel you have to call facts the facts and, and say what is true. And there's a reason that the US Supreme Court has one of the lowest public approval ratings in the history of our nation because they're not serving the role they're supposed to serve. They're supposed to serve as an objective interpreter 
of the law, let the chips fall where they may. Not be activists and ideology, uh, ideologue, ideologues, which is what I believe in many cases they are. The U.S. Supreme Court is saying that abortion is banned. There's really not a lot you could do. You can make the best arguments to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but we have signed up for a democracy where the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest law of the land. But I don't think we're there yet. I don't think anyone's talking about that. But there's a lot of things people weren't talking about until we were talking about it. So you have to be prepared. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what they what they, what they say. So under Roe versus Wade, there was a right, an affirmative right to an abortion. Um, under under Dobbs, there's no right to an abortion at the federal level in the U.S. Constitution, but states can decide whatever they want. And some states have decided to criminalize abortion. Other states have expanded access to reproductive health care and, and abortion. And, and so I think it's assumed in, in your question um, might be the idea that the U.S. Supreme Court will criminalize abortion, that they will say it's it's illegal and that it's criminal. And, so, and that's been discussed in some places. In North, North or South Carolina, a legislative proposal to provide the death penalty to any person who who seeks and receives an abortion, um, not not the law there, but it was just the fact that that was thought out loud and put into a legislative proposal is frightening. Um, if it becomes a crime, like any uh, place, um, there is discretion in what you prosecute, and there are priorities that you have in your office. You can really focus on certain things with your limited resources and not with others. Prosecutorial discretion is a legal. Um, concept that is exercised every day by district attorneys so um and u.s attorneys if they have if they really want to go after you know the war on drugs as opposed to other crimes they they can and they will and there might be some folks that really go hard on criminalizing um abortions if it's banned and criminalized and others who um are focused on other priorities and less focused on that okay. what Protecting our natural resources, addressing climate change, um, and our climate crisis is one of the biggest things that the California Attorney General's office does and um, that AGs do throughout the nation. And it looks like a, a lot of different things. One of the big things that we do is we, we work with the federal government quite a bit on pride, providing comment on their, their proposals um, to protect our, our waterways, to um, make sure that we're reducing emissions from vehicles, including automobiles, as well as light, medium, and heavy duty uh, trucks. And so California has led on all those things and provided some of the most aggressive proposals that have been adopted nationwide. We also sue when uh, fossil fuel companies for their contributions to uh, the climate crisis. Right now we have a, a first of its kind investigation against ExxonMobil for fueling the global plastics pollution crisis. And some of the data and information that we've seen, documents that we've seen, are remind you of the tobacco uh, industry, where they're you know huddled with their research and they're saying, you can't really recycle plastics, but if we tell the world that we can, they will use it freely. And if you put those chasing arrows on them, they'll think that you put it in the recycling bin, even though most of what you put in the recycling bin ends up in the dump and cannot be recycled and is not recycled and ends up in our waterways or is incinerated. So that's a type of an example of going after folks for fueling the global um, plastics pollution crisis. But also uh, there's a, a, a rising number of localities and states that are suing um, the major fossil fuel companies for creating the climate crisis under a theory of public nuisance and other theories. and. Um, that has been in some procedural uh, machinations moving between state court and federal court. The fossil fuel companies want to be in federal court. The uh, plaintiffs, uh, the people want to be in state court. And that issue has been decided here in the Ninth Circuit for the first time that we can be in state court, which is a, a better place to be for those of us who want to address uh, the climate crisis. And so um, I'll just say without saying anything, stay tuned for what California might do in that regard. And that's like a, like a home run swing, really holding accountable 
um, fossil fuel companies for creating, for knowing, for de deceiving um, the people about the climate crisis and for um, not just being able to um, make all the impacts on the climate as an externality to their business being paid for by the public, but they have to take responsibility for, for mitigation and change behavior and um, affirmative steps to address the climate crisis. But on the climate crisis, we, we cannot be aggressive enough. There's nothing that you can do that, that is too aggressive. The scope, scale, and speed of the problem requires solutions that match it in scope, speed, and scale. And it mean, you know, and if California is not gonna be one of the most aggressive in the whole world, then we're all doomed because that is our role. That is what we do. That is our brand, that's our identity. That's been historically what we've done. And so we need to push California or um, America to do the most it can. And then we need other countries to join, including the, you know, the major industrial countries. So um, good, okay, thank you.